Today on What It's Like, 1936, Cord 810, Westchester. This is the first mass-produced front-wheel drive car with independent front suspension. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like, the automotive channel that gives you the scoop on all of the classics. Vintage, some exotics. We love the orphan cars here. Just for reference, this is our 271st episode so far, 93 of which have been orphan cars. Anyway, we dive in deep with the specs, period ads, button switches and knobs, and most importantly, show what these cars are like. If that sounds like a channel that you will totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. This 1936 Cord Model 810 Westchester is currently for sale by a private individual. Link will be in the description if interested. A little bit about this car. This car was originally pale, almost like a canary yellow, and has been in the same family for over 30 years. It runs and drives. The doors open and shut great. For more information, pricing, and pictures pertaining to this very car, be sure to click the link below after the show. Errett Lobin Cord, or most people call him by his abbreviated name, E.L. Cord, born 20th of July, 1894, in Warrensburg, Missouri, or Missouri, depending on where you're from and how you pronounce it. Even as a young boy, Cord would mess around with mechanics and figure out how stuff worked. He would much rather do that than go to school. He would fix and race Model Ts. Cord was 30 when he took over Auburn. Auburn was founded in 1900. It actually evolved from the Eckert Carriage Company, which was founded in 1874, renamed Auburn in 1900. Eckerd Brothers would sell Auburn to a group of investors from Chicago in 1919. But the group of investors wasn't able to make the company profitable. They approached E.L. Cord in 1924 to help them sell cars. Cord turned around and said, what if I just took over the company? Think of E.L. Cord as the J.P. Morgan of the auto industry. E.L. Cord had over 150 companies in his portfolio. In 1926, Cord acquired Duesenberg. The interesting bit is it wasn't until 1929 that Cord founded the Cord Corporation as a holding company with over 150 companies in his portfolio. We're not getting into all of the companies, but he had control over Lycoming Engines, New York, Ship Building, Checker Motors, Stinson, Aircraft are a few in his portfolio. In 1931, Auburn was recognized as America's 13th largest seller of cars in the United States. By 1937, the Great Depression had really taken its toll on the luxury car market. Just to put in perspective, the only company that was independent that survived the Great Depression without help was Packard. Everybody else ceased to exist or they buddied up with somebody. In 1937, Cord sold the Cord Corporation to Aviation Corporation. Cord would go into the real estate business as well as radio stations even was a Nevada state legislator. E.L. Cord died in 1974 at the age of 79. Talk about a time to live. He saw horse and buggies, to train, to the car, to the airplane. Then we went to the moon. He saw all of that in his lifetime. Cord was best known for two cars, the L29 Cord, which preceded the 810 and 812 Cord. This was the first mass-produced front-wheel drive car. It's important to note that it wasn't the first front-wheel drive car. That actually goes to Miller. <coughs> Legendary race car driver, Harry Miller, who has an uncanny resemblance to a very good friend of mine. The model 810 Cord took what the L29 had and packaged it in a more streamlined body designed by Gordon Borig, who was the chief designer at Duesenberg. He moved to GM in 1933 with declining sales. While at GM, he proposed a streamlined sedan with a blunt nose with concealed headlights. It placed last with Harley Earl and other GM executives. What a turn of events because this is considered to be one of the most beautiful cars of all time. Gordon was lured back to Duesenberg. They wanted to design a baby Duesenberg. Cord wanted his company to be like GM 
and Ford, he wanted to offer many different options. So he wanted to have a baby Duesenberg, Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg at the very top. None of it came to fruition though. So this design became the 810 slash 812 Cord. 1936 Cord came in four body styles. Sportsman, Phaeton, two four-door offerings were offered, the Westchester and the Beverly. The differences between the Westchester and the Beverly were the Westchester had broad cloth interior and a small trunk. Beverly was built with only the finest materials and had a bigger trunk. In 1937, there was two more body styles on offer, the Custom Beverly and the Burline. The Burline had a partition in the center, and both of those rode a longer 132-inch wheelbase. So let's talk about some discrepancies about the Cord. Cord 810 and 812. 1936 Cord 810 is the model. 1937 812. There was supposed to be an 814 in 1938. Only one of those is known to exist or ever be built. They didn't offer a blower and or a supercharger until 1937. All supercharged cars are the 812. It's possible to get an 812 without a supercharger, but it's not possible to get an 810 with a supercharger unless they added the supercharger afterwards. Before moving on to specs, the Cord 810 was a very innovative car. Here is a list of firsts that pertain to the Cord 810. First car to be mass produced with independent front suspension with front wheel drive. First car with head and headlights. First car with the radiator underneath the hood. First car to have a grill that wraps around the hood. First car to use a single piece hood that opens alligator style. First car with variable speed wipers. First car with locking gas cap. Let's talk specs. 189 inches long, 77 inches wide. It rides a wheelbase of 125 inches. It weighs 3,000 pounds. Price, $2,000, which is equivalent to you spending $41,921.67 in the year 2023. So that would be like buying a Tesla Model 3 of today's era with all of the gizmos and gadgets. Total 810 and 812 cord production, this was both 36 and 37, was 2,972, of which there was only 688 of them were supercharged from the factory. 1936 cord production was 1,764. There's estimated to be about 1,800 cars survive. Moving on to engines. Only one engine on offer, 288.6 cubic inch displacement, Lycoming Flathead V8, 4.7 liters. It's good for 125 brake horsepower, 3,500 RPM, bore of 3.5 inches, stroke of 3.8 inches, compression 6.5 to 1. It is backed by a four-speed manual transmission, that has the electric hand. If you remember back to our Hudson episode, Hudson actually developed the electric hand with Bendix, and then they just sold the same exact system to Cord. The electric hand was essentially a stock that came off the right-hand side of the steering wheel column. It allowed you to shift gears with your thumb, and the gears shifted by electric and vacuum pressure. A.B. Jenkins won Stevenson's challenge in a supercharged cord. His average speed was 79.58 miles per hour. He traveled 1,909.85 miles in 24 hours, a record that would stand for 17 years. It was eventually beat in 1954 by a Hemi-powered Chrysler. So let's talk styling. Just notice everything that's going on look at how this looks top down it almost looks like a trident crest there as you can hear it's running it's very quiet very smooth running engine with this bumper and how it's designed the bumper's almost like old mixes with new Notice this has pop-up headlights. Just notice down here, it's completely smooth, but the higher you go, the more of a point it gets. 
when you get to the top here it turns into more of like a crease and it comes back this is my favorite line of this whole car is right here this almost looks like a Dallahay or a Bugatti also notice right underneath mud flaps nice attention to detail this car does not have running boards but it's a teardrop shape it comes the car's widest point is right here look at this catwalk region look at the way that these fins are designed This is often referred to as the coffin cord because the nose looks like a coffin. Better look at how this fender is designed. So check out the door situation. One door is suicide front door, traditional rear door. Also notice the handles are opposite. They point into one another. Gravel guards. Look at how this rear fender is designed. It's just like the front fender where in the center there becomes a point and that point continues all the way to the back. Another really nice line right there check out the rear bumpers they mimic the front bumpers look at the rear design split window and notice how the windows are kind of like pressed in they kind of have that pressed in look gas filler door is right here and notice it has a key to lock and unlock it so here's what the trunk situation looks like there's full-size spare it's really not that big back here considering the size of the car but then again it's 1936 a lot of cars didn't have built-in trunks here's what the trunk looks like from the trunk lid Notice there's a wire going up there. That's for the trunk light. So check out how this catch works. See how it comes up like that. You just move it out of the way. It catches on this little this metal piece here. Look at these latches for the trunk. It's like an actual suitcase trunk. How that works. So coming up and getting inside. Notice it opens up the opposite way. And that's as far open as it goes. This is a nice fabric material. There isn't an armrest here, but it does have a window crank for the for the big window, and it operates like this. Door handle to get out. Take a look at this interior. Coming down inside the pedal box down here, hand brake, clutch, brake, gas pedal. I'm gonna show the struggles of getting in. <laughs> I guess, guess you just have to put the one foot over and then scooch in. Here's what over the hood looks like. Here's what first person over the hood looks like. Underneath the steering wheel, there's tons of room to put my hand underneath. On to the button switches and knobs. All the way left is a crank for the driver's side headlight. There is another crank on the other side for the passenger side headlight. Starter button. Crank knob for the driver's side windshield. Coolant temperature. Speedometer with odometer and tripometer inside of it. Gasoline gauge. Tachometer. Dash light in between the tack and the oil pressure. Clock. Crank for the passenger side windshield. Gauge just below that, which I'm not entirely sure what that's for. Amp meter, key, headlights, gas, choke. You have to turn the gas on. There's a pump inside the tank and that's what that's for. Instrument panel lights, electric hand gear shifter. Above 
There are sun visors. They're a bit on the slender side. Here's my hand for reference. There's also a sun visor for the passenger. Look at that. That's pretty cool. That looks like a speaker. That's pretty cool. Rear view mirror is mounted on the dash. The windshield cranks out with these crank knobs here. And it cranks out on both sides. Passenger over here. Notice the windshield wipers are mounted on the top of the windshield, making this possible. Not only do the windshields crank out, but there's also a cowl vent for both passenger and driver. Driver's side one is right here. So coming to the rear door, just look at the shape of this rear door. Also check out how this ridge connects with this. There isn't an armrest on this door panel. The rear door has map pockets and they look like that. This is the door handle to get out, window crank for the big window. This is how much space you have getting in the rear seat. This is what the front looks like from the back. Let's take a quick gander at the greenhouse or the pillar to glass ratio. There is a nice shelf behind the rear passengers. That is what visibility looks like out the rear from the back seat. Creature comforts, there are lights on both sides. There isn't any coat hooks, nor armrests. This is what the seat profile looks like. This seat is really, really comfortable. It is nice and reclined, just like the front seat. The front seat might be a little bit more comfortable. Knee space, there's enough. There's enough um, space for me to put my fingers in between my knees and the front seat. The rear seat is so comfortable that it doesn't matter as far as knee space is concerned. There is an ashtray as well as robe rail to put a heavy blanket on for the passengers in the rear in the winter time so they don't get cold. This is what I look like sitting in the back seat. I got tons of headroom. This is a very comfortable car. That's so cool. Look at where the horns are mounted. Yeah, they, they work. They're not as strong, but I don't think the ground is quite. What's that? That's the transmission. That's what oh, shifts. That's the it. transmission. Yep. You know, see, here's the electrical wires, and then the shifter, shifter linkage is down there. It shifts it. So that's why this is all designed yeah. like that. Yeah. So yeah. it fits. See, there's that. a cylinder right there that goes out here and shifts it. Oh, that's okay. crazy. On the positive side, wow car status. It is one of the most recognized mid to late 30s automobiles ever to exist. Design and engineering brilliance, fine road manners, can't miss investment, CCCA classic status, windshield cranks out as well as the cow vents, super comfy seats, two speed, variable wipers, gauges for everything, has his and her glove boxes, against it mechanically unreliable has vapor lock issues from day one high operating costs rarely come up for sale can be hard to get in and out of if you're big and or tall small trunk in relation to the size of the car visibility is hard to see out of this thing from the rear window also sides it is hard to see out of the sides and the windshield isn't as tall as you think it is. It's a small window to look out, all things considered, but I would still own this car. It is a very awesome 
car. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather. Two scenarios today. In the first scenario, they are all four-door sedans, 1935 Hupmobile or 1936 Cord A10 or 1936 Chrysler Imperial. I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Moving on to the second scenario. If you were given the choice between any of these three, which one would you have? 1936 Cord A10 or 1929 L29 Cord or 1937 Cord Supercharged 812. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me both the name of the band and song title, both correctly, in the comment section, will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, maybe you have a car that you'd like reviewed, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you don't have Facebook and would like to get a hold of me, shoot me an email. All of that will be linked in the description below. Just know I appreciate all of the support. And until next time, toodaloo! Hey kids, what time is it? Eight.